let's have a look first on how we can actually characterize signals. To characterize signals or anything else, we first need to find some attributes that we can put on the object to characterize. Here I'm starting out with the dependency on time. So signals can be time independent and signals can be time dependent. The first version, time independent signals, is shown on this slide. I expect that you have heard about time independent signals already. In terms of electrical signals, we are often talking about voltages and currents, and time independent means they are static. They are steady state, they are always the same value no matter which point in time we are looking at them. That also means the circuit behaves the same way at any given point in time. In terms of electrical circuits, we often call that DC, which stands for direct current, no matter if we are talking about a, actually a voltage or a current. Now the other category are time-dependent signals. And that's where it gets uh, more interesting. We can find ways more attributes to actually characterize subcategories of time-dependent signals. The analogy to the DC, the direct current here, is the AC. So that's an alternating current. In this course, we're going to focus very much on all the time dependency of signals and of derived attributes like power, energy, and then how the circuits actually behave when you apply time dependent signals on them. As a subcategory, of time dependent signals, they can be either periodic, as in this case up here, or they can be non periodic. If a signal is periodic, like this voltage here, voltage as a function of t, that means that it's going to repeat itself after a given time period, which is indicated here by the big T, that one here. The big T is called the period and uh, very often represented by a capital letter T. It can also be a current, but that's the mathematical equation to represent the periodicity of a signal. Now within the periodic signals, we can have sinusoidal signals and we can have non-sinusoidal signals. So there are subcategories again. Sinusoidal signals are mathematically very well described by trigonometric functions that is a sine wave or a cosine wave, which are dependent on each other, just a phase delay of the 90 degrees. Sinusoidal signals are the basis for the analysis of all other periodic functions, as we will see later when we look at the non-sinusoidal signals. The practical impact of sinusoidal signals, so the way to use them in the laboratory or in other in other ways is, for example, at the grid, the grid voltage, the AC mains, the power delivery net, so the electrical uh, energy that we are getting into our households or into our buildings. That is typically in the, in the European area, 230 volts RMS and 50 hertz, which is the, the, the amplitude and the frequency of the sinusoidal voltage coming out of our outlets. In the, in the US, it's, for example, 110 volts and 60 hertz. We are using sinusoidal signals for wireless, wireless transmissions. For example, FM radio and AM radio is a modulation of, of a sinusoidal signal. And very often, we can also see sinusoidal signals in the laboratory as test signals for testing circuits, for measuring circuits, for figuring out how our circuits actually behave before we can turn them into products. Now, non-sinusoidal signals are, the, are basically mathematically constructed by the superimposition of various periodic functions. And that means of very sinusoidal signals. So you just put a couple of sinusoidal signals on top of each other. You superimpose those periodic functions you actually use the sinusoidal signals that we've spoken about previously 
and that is called the Fourier series that we're going to look into very soon in this course here, how to construct non-sinusoidal signals based on a sine wave or a cosine wave. Non-sinusoidal signals also have a very practical use. They are very well suited for describing other electronical signals. For example, digital signals, you can construct a square wave, a pulse, out of a number of overlays of super in, uh, superposition of sinusoidal signals. Then there are the non-periodic signals. So the category down here on the slide. Um, we can use non-periodic signals to uh, describe the behavior at startup and at shutdown of electrical circuits. We can look at the response time of circuits to one-time events like a trigger. So for example, you are receiving a phone call and the phone is registering, hey, some, somebody's calling me, something is happening. That would be a trigger, that would be a flag raised for the processor there. And then it would take the necessary measures to turn on the display, to activate all the functions in the controller that are necessary to inform the user, hey, there's a phone call coming in. And then you might swipe the green button downwards or wherever you're swiping it to actually take the call. And that would then be the next trigger, also called an interrupt for in terms of digital, digital circuits which then triggers to turn on the microphone, to turn on the loudspeaker, and it also triggers the connection to the other uh, participant in the call. A very different kind of non-periodic signal is noise. And the term noise is, is widely used, um, but a very intrinsic definition of noise is actually the other way around, that it has to be non-periodic so it has to be in the lower category here to be categorized as noise. As soon as you can find a frequency for anything, any signal you could find around, it cannot be noise. Let's have a look into examples of signals first. Now going back to the periodic signals and the ones that you know already pretty well from any kind of math background you might be bringing to this course are the sinusoidal. And sinusoidal and cosinusoidal are basically not that much different other than the sine wave is basically 90 degrees behind in time. The cosine had its maximum already at the time zero on this axis here, whereas the sine wave is still reaching its maximum 90 degrees later, a quarter of a period later in time. We get the period again down here, we've spoken already previously, and we'll have a look at that again, which is necessary, a necessary attribute, a necessary feature to be a periodic signal. Now the practical impact and the applications of sinusoidal signals are mainly in analog electronics. You can see them in audio for testing, for example, a one kilohertz test signal in audio is very common. And very common use is certainly the grid, the AC mains. We've spoken about that previously, 50 hertz in Europe, 60 hertz in the US. And then other parts of the world are also applying either 50 or 60 hertz. And it's varying in different amplitudes. But as soon as we have an amplitude and a frequency or a period, then the signal is actually defined and maybe a face as well to distinguish if you're in a sine wave or a cosine wave or anywhere in between. Now when speaking about sinusoidal signals being the basis of analog electronics, that doesn't mean that digital electronics are not to be described through sinusoidal waveforms as well, because as we will see later, the sinusoidal waveforms are the basis for all the other waveforms that we're going to look at and that are periodic. So basically you could say the more power there is involved or the higher the frequency is, the more analog even digital signals are getting. Now the next example of periodic signals here is a pulse. A pulse or pulses as they are shown on, on this slide here is a repetition of signals going from a high state up here to a low state down here. 
So we got a digital one up here at the high state and we got a digital zero down here at the low start. And as the signal is repeating, so it, it's gonna turn into a one again afterwards and a zero later, that's the periodicity of the signal. Similar to, to uh, pulses, I'm defining them as squares here. You could also say the last signal was a square, um, but I'm trying to keep to pulses for what's going between one and zero and then squares for something like that. This one here is centered uh, across the time axis. So it has, it has the high state above zero and the low state uh, below zero. Very commonly seen in power electronics, for example, things like uh, laptop chargers, mobile phones, audio amplifiers. Um, these are often toggling between the, the high supply rail, which would be up here. So that could be like 30 volts DC supply up here. And then it's going towards the negative rail, uh, which could be, for example, minus 30 volts in case of an audio amplifier could also be uh, any, any other voltage level you might encounter inside power electronics. Triangles are an interesting signal coming up in analog electronics, also in kind of in digital electronics, but probably not that visualized here. For example, in counters, counting up from a negative value to a positive value in that case, you also see them in, in power electronics where you use them as a carrier, as an oscillator to generate the correct frequencies that you're the correct other signals that you're using in, uh, in power stages. Can be counting up and down as this one here. And if it's not counting down, but it's jumping down, then we're speaking about a, a signal called sawtooth. The sawtooth is starting down here at zero and uh, counting upwards all the way to its maximum which would be up here and then it resets and goes back all the way down to zero just to start all over again we can see already the period time t is already down here also known from power electronics and also again in terms of counters depending if you want to count up and down or you only want to count up this one would only be counting up and then resetting. Non-periodic signals are very often seen at the turn on and the turning off of uh, circuits. So here we got the green waveform representing a turn off, like a step function, stepping from a high state to a low state and a turn on function, state, uh, stepping from the low state here, down here to a high state, very often seen in digital electronics for example the 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 case where a mobile phone is receiving a call then it starts triggering something as we spoke about previous another non-periodic signal very often seen in the discharge of batteries or discharge of capacitors but can also be in very other uh, cases or exponential functions in this very specific case, a falling exponential function. So you might just have charged your, your mobile phone here to, to the maximum voltage and then you're using it the whole day. So now the time axis might be actually a whole day. And some point at the evening, you reach the minimum operating point before the mobile phone actually turns off and is running out of battery. That doesn't necessarily need to be zero that can also be any other kind of voltage level when it's not enough to power the circuits anymore. Rising exponential functions are the, the, the opposite thing. Then you, you got home, you found your charger, you are at the low point here, you're starting down here, and after a while the phone is charged to its maximum, it's getting close to, to the maximum uh, voltage that you can have across the battery and it would show on the display again that it is fully charged. Same thing is for a car battery, but also just for a, for a capacitor inside the electronics. Now we are coming to noise. Noise is a non-periodic signal. So if any signal can be described with the frequency, with the periodicity, it cannot be noise. 
there is white noise from resistors, there is 1 over F noise in amplifiers, and then you can also see cosmic noise and things like that in wireless transmissions. That said, another mobile phone or another application, a Bluetooth Co uh, a Bluetooth connection being disturbed by a close by mobile phone that is not noise as the mobile phone or the Bluetooth are actually signals that do have a periodicity they do have a period and they are disturbing each other so that is not what is generally going under the, the broad term of noise and how it's often reused. Then you can put these signals together you can put periodic and non-periodic signals together and you can put any other kind of signals on top of each other, superimpose them by just adding them. Superposition in this case here of a sine wave and a falling exponential function could be uh, seen in a dampened sine wave oscillation that we're going to look at uh, towards the end of this course here when we look at passive filters and also when we look at oscillators. You can put a step function, the turn on signal, the let's get going, we are getting a phone call signal on top of a pulse, where the, the pulses could, for example, be the clock signal that is uh, providing the timing for any kind of microprocessor or for any kind of graphics processor or any other digital circuit microcontroller and so on. So the turn on is happening when you press the turn on button, for example, on the re remote control of your TV and then the clock for the graphics processor in the digital TV starts to turn on and provides the timing for generating the horizontal lines and for generating the vertical rows to create the pixels at your screen, which is being done at a very specific frequency, could be, for example, that one. So that's the period of that signal here. In modern electronics, you could actually see those frequencies to be reaching the, the gigahertz range, at least inside the, the microcontrollers, inside the, the processors. Then you can also see the superposition of, for example, square waves and noise. Very often it actually is still a periodic signal that you're having on top of each other there. But when you're really far down in the measurement resolution of the instruments, you could start to see the noise level either of your circuit or the noise level of the instrument you're actually measuring with. An example where you would see those kind of things could be a noise in a motor control or noise in an audio amplifier at its output. And that can actually be audible. You could also have noise on the, on the lines towards an LED light, but you probably wouldn't see it if it's just changing a little bit. In LEDs, uh, you can only see the resolution when you're actually in a very dark room. Dim all the way down, all the way down, and try to see the last little bit of, of energy where you still can see the the, uh, the LED lighting up. Again, the, the noise is uh, the real noise that doesn't have a period anymore. It's typically very far down as low as the nanovolt range, which is typically below the capability of what you can measure with oscilloscopes. So what you're measuring in the time domain, then you need to go over to the frequency domain, use frequency analyzers, which can actually do that kind of of precision and you can actually measure so far down. A very often occurring superposition of periodic and non-periodic signals is the superposition of a DC. The DC level is indicated on this slide down here with the gray stippled line here and then the sine wave, the red line, is the final signal on top of each other. So actually the sine wave is centered around the DC instead of centered around the zero line. Um, and that's just simply by adding those two signals up on each other. The practical use of it or the, the way where you would actually see that would be, for example, analog signals and, and battery-driven applications 
So that is the, the mobile phone that, or a car, which is uh, supplied by uh, typically a 12 volt battery. And then all the signals need to stay between the zero volts, the negative terminal of the battery. And in the case of a car, 12 volts. In case of a laptop, it would be around 18 volts. In case of a mobile phone, you're at around 3.3 volts or 5 volts at the battery level. And then uh, you center all those signals in between the lowest level the battery can provide, which is typically ground, zero, and the highest level it can uh, provide. Practically, you could measure analog signals, for example, on the, on the check stick output of your of your mobile phone, of your tablet, of your computer, as long as you still have those kind of things and not turn it into Bluetooth. So here the, the lowest audio signal you could get out is when, the, when you're actually oscillating or when the, the signal goes all the way down to the ground. And the highest one you can get it out is when you're reaching the battery level and otherwise you would center the signal around half of the battery voltage, which is the DC offset. Now in a different kind of mathematical superposition, mm -hmm. instead of adding signals up, they could also be nested into each other. So one could be the argument for the other one. And in this case here, a sine wave is the argument of another sine wave here. So actually starting to modulate the frequency with another sine wave. And that's exactly where we see that in practice, it's in frequency uh, uh, modulation, which can also be transferred mathematically into phase modulation. It's basically the, the same thing, just uh, doing with two different parameters. And this one is the basis for all kind of radio, radio broad, broadcasting, uh, for all kind of radio broadcasting that we are listening to.